All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. So in this lesson, we're going to continue on our collection of talking about ICU drip medications. And in particular, in this lesson, we're going to talk about our antiarrhythmics, and we're really going to lay the foundation of information that you need to really understand these medications, which we'll go into more depth in the next lesson. But before we begin, if this is your first time to this channel and watching one of our videos, we do invite you to subscribe to our channel below. Make sure you hit that bell icon though, that way you'll be notified whenever those new lessons become available. We really do value the subscriptions, the likes, and the comments that you guys leave for us, and for that I do want to thank you. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. So like I said, in this lesson we're going to cover that foundational information that you guys are going to need to really understand the antiarrhythmics, how they're working, what they're doing uh, when we talk about that stuff in the next lesson. But to really kick things off, let's start off and really talk about what are antiarrhythmics. It's probably pretty self-explanatory, but essentially the antiarrhythmics are a category of medications that we're going to use to treat abnormal heart rhythms. And the goal is to restore normal rhythm and conduction. Now I do want to take you guys back to the days of school and I want to cover some of the basic foundational concepts that are really going to be important to you guys here. So to start that off, let's take a look at our heart. And what I want to do here is do a quick review of the electrical conduction system of the heart. And this isn't going to be very in depth because there's actually another lesson which I'm going to link to up above that I did covering this in much more detail. So you're welcome to watch that lesson if you want some more information. But the basics are essentially this. We have our SA node, which is our primary pacemaker for our heart, with, which is in the right atrium. Its job is to send out a signal to the heart muscle and telling it to contract. We also have Bachmann's bundle, which takes that signal and propagates it to the left atrium so that both sides get the signal together. And those signals also travel down a couple pathways that we call the intranodal pathways and go to our AV node. AV node is going to delay that signal before sending it down the bundle of his, which goes into our right and left bundle branches, and then out into our Purkinje fibers, into the ventricles, so that all the muscles can contract in this coordinated fashion. And again, the goal of this conduction system is to send these electrical signals throughout the cardiac muscles, end goal of stimulating that contraction. And that contraction is going to take place with these cardiac myocytes. I'm going to go ahead and draw out a couple of them here. The most important characteristic of these cells is that they have those myofibrils, which if you remember are made up of those myosin and actin that together can work to contract the size of that cell down, which is where we ultimately get our muscle contraction from. And so if we take a look at one of our relaxed cells, you can see that we're going to have pretty stretched out, not really overlapping myosin and actin strands in here. But when a signal is received, this cascades down a process which ultimately leads to an overlapping of these proteins, which is ultimately going to shrink the size of this cell. And this is what we see in our contracted cell. And there's primarily one ion that's going to be responsible for this contraction, and that's going to be our calcium ion. And really the last thing that I want to talk about with these cells is they're actually connected to one another, and they are able to pass this electrical activity that initiates in the SA node, and they're able to pass that to one another through these things called gap junctions. Now for simplicity, I just drew these here, but what this allows is a change in electrical activity to move from one cell to the next, cascading that signal to contract. So it's a pretty complicated ballet of our conduction system, and even from cell to cell with these gap junctions, relaying that message through to all the cardiac myocytes in our heart in a synchronized fashion so we get a synchronized contraction that effectively can move the blood throughout our body. And so the way that this signal works is it's not an electrical activity like 
how we think of with electrical outlets and plugging things in, but there are charges, and this is all related to something that we call an action potential. And an action potential is just the movement of different ions across the membrane of a cell, changing the membrane potential of that cell. So that might not make sense just yet. Just stick with me here. This will make sense in just a minute, I promise. And so again, if we have one of our cardiac myocytes here, normally they're going to have a negative charge inside the cell and a positive charge outside the cell. And this membrane potential is this difference in charge across the cell membrane. And what's really causing these charges are these different ions, which are primarily going to be our sodium, potassium, and calcium. So outside the cell, we're going to have more concentrations of our sodium and our calcium outside, whereas on the inside, we're going to have a greater concentration of our potassium. And while all of these ions are positively charged, the net effect here is that we end up with this negative charge inside the cell and positive charge outside the cell. And this is really maintained through a couple different pumps that work to bring sodium outside the cell and potassium in the cell, as well as another one that brings the calcium outside and works to restore this normal balanced membrane potential. But essentially, an action potential is a short-term reversal of this membrane potential. And so what happens is we get a change in these concentration of ions, and as these change within the cell, the cell is going to become more positive, which is what we call depolarized. And so because of either these gap junctions or other processes, depending on the cell that we're looking at, the cell voltage is naturally going to change to a less negative state until we reach something that we call the threshold. And once this threshold is crossed, this triggers a cascade of things which ultimately lead to the cell depolarizing. All right, so let's talk about a couple things that hopefully will help to make this make a little bit more sense for you guys. There's actually two different types of action potentials within the heart and this conduction system that we really want to talk about. The first is our pacemaker action potential, and the other is our myocyte action potential. Now there are other action potentials when we look at skeletal muscle, uh, even neurons within the brain, but for the sake of this lesson and really their application to our antiarrhythmic medications, these are the two that I want you guys to have an understanding of. So we're going to start off talking about the pacemaker action potential. And so as you can see, these action potentials look quite a bit different, but they also function in different ways and serve different purposes, which is the main reason that they are quite so different. So we will talk through the different parts here, but it's important to know that this is looking at what the charge of the cell is. On the left-hand side, you have the scale for millivolts. And normally our cell, like we talked about, is going to have a negative charge. And then as the action potential happens and the cell depolarizes, the cell will move into that positive charge territory before eventually returning back into the negative territory. And like I just mentioned, that the cell's voltage is going to change until we hit some sort of threshold. And that's what the green line on each of these stands for, is this is going to be our threshold. So this pacemaker action potential is something that we're going to find in our SA and AV nodes. It's also going to be similar but a little bit quicker within the Purkinje cells. Important distinction here with this action potential is that we're not going to have any resting membrane potential. And you can really see this here by this continuous slope towards the positive territory that we're going to find with these cells. And the reason we see this is because of something that we call funny currents. And this is a process that slowly allows sodium to leak into the cell whenever the voltage of that cell is less than 40 millivolts. So anytime we're below the threshold, these funny currents are going to allow that sodium to come in, slowly bringing the charge of that cell towards the positive direction. Like I said, this is going to spontaneously increase the voltage from around negative 60 millivolts, which is where the cell normally would want to be, until we hit that threshold of negative 40. 
And I'm going to go ahead and label this on here because this is going to be what we call phase four of the action potential. It's also what we call the pacemaker potential phase. And as you can think about here, this is going to happen at a pretty consistent rate, which is where we get our automaticity from with these cells. But what happens is when we hit this threshold of negative 40, we open up what we call calcium channels. And these calcium channels, as their name suggests, is going to allow an influx of calcium inside the cell until we reach about positive 10 millivolts. And this is a fairly quick process, but this is going to happen much quicker in other cardiac cells, including those Purkinje cells. Now this part of the action potential graph that we have here is what we call the rising or depolarizing phase, or phase zero. Now once we hit the peak, what happens next is we have potassium channels that are going to open and allow the potassium to leave the cell. At the same time, these calcium channels are going to close, so we're going to stop bringing in positive ions and allowing other positive ions to leave the cell. And so this is going to lead to a quick decline in the voltage of that cell. Now this particular phase of the action potential is one that we call either the falling or the repolarization phase, which is also phase three. And so after this, as you can see, we return back to that negative 60 millivolts. We have various ion pumps that are going to return the normal concentration gradients within the cells. And we're going to continue the process again back into phase four. And so you might have noticed and be wondering, well, what happened to phase one and two? Well, that's actually something that we're going to cover when we talk about the myocyte action potential. But within the pacemaker action potential, we really only have these three phases. And you'll see why we number them this way, because these actually line up to similar parts of the myocyte action potential. Now, like I talked about, this process is a spontaneous process that's going to be generated by these nodal cells but we can see significant modification of these by external forces. So either influenced by autonomic nerves, hormones can have an effect on these, drugs like we'll talk about here in a bit, obviously ions are gonna change this, and even something like ischemia and hypoxia can all have an influence on this whole process, which can ultimately lead to a change in your patient's heart rhythm. And so that's how things work with our pacemaker cells. Really the primary goal of these cells is to initiate that signal, which is going to be spread either through the conduction system or out into neighboring cells, and then ultimately passed along to additional neighboring cells through those gap junctions. So now let's move on and talk about the myocyte action potential. So this is going to be the action potential that we see in the actual contractile cardiac muscle cells. Once again, we have our millivolts here on the left, but as you can see, the, the numbers are going to be different. We still have our threshold, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And you can see the tracing of the change of the cell's charge is quite a bit different than the pacemaker. And we'll see why here in just a minute that is. So like I said, we're going to find this action potential in those contractile cardiac muscle cells. Now, interesting distinction here is we do have a resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. And so if you look at our tracing, you can see that we have a completely flat line here. Once again, we're gonna have more potassium within our cells and more sodium and calcium outside of our cells, but we're not gonna have those funny currents leaking that sodium into the cell, slowly changing its potential. So this is just gonna hold steady at this negative 90 millivolts until something happens. So this phase of the action potential is the fourth phase, and it's something that we call the resting phase. So now the next thing that's gonna happen is we're actually gonna get sodium and calcium ions to leak into the cell through those gap junctions, and this is gonna cause the voltage of the cell to raise to negative 70 millivolts, which I'm gonna show right about here. And this is going to cause the cell to hit that threshold of negative 70. Now, once we hit this voltage of negative 70, this is going to cause these special channels that we call fast sodium channels to open up. And this is going to lead to a rapid influx of sodium into the cell and a sharp rise in that cell's voltage until we hit, once again, positive 10 millivolts. 
Now, in addition to this, at about negative 40 millivolts, we're also going to see another group of channels open up, and these are something that we call slow calcium channels. And this is going to allow calcium to come into the cell at this point, further depolarizing the cell. And thus we call this phase zero or the depolarizing phase. So when the cell reaches that positive 10 millivolts, those fast sodium channels are actually going to close. But those slow calcium channels are actually going to be staying open for quite some time still. But another unique thing happens at this positive 10 millivolt point is we get something that we call voltage-gated potassium channels. And these are going to open up, and as you can figure, this is going to cause potassium to leave the cell, causing a slight decrease in the voltage of the cell. So this is that first decrease that we start to see here. This is something we call phase one, or the early repolarization phase. And so at this point, we have these slow calcium channels and these voltage-gated potassium channels that are staying open together. So we have positive calcium ions coming into the cell and positive potassium ions leaving the cell. And at this point, we're going to see the voltage remain relatively stable. And this is what we call phase two, or the plateau phase of the action potential. And this is really the defining characteristic of the cardiac action potential. And like we talked about, calcium is going to be the primary ion responsible for the contraction of those cardiac muscle cells. And while the calcium that's going to be coming in in this influx from these calcium channels is not going to be enough to stimulate contraction, it does trigger something unique within these myocytes, something that's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to trigger that to release massive amounts of calcium, which is going to then bind to that myosin and actin, causing that contraction. And so by having this plateau phase, this is going to cause that contraction to have enough time and sustain long enough to give us a forceful, meaningful contraction, again with the goal of being able to move blood around our body. Now at the end of this plateau phase, the slow calcium channels are going to close, but at the same time, we still have these voltage-gated potassium channels that are still open and are going to continue to allow potassium to leave the cell, which is ultimately going to return the cell back to that resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. And this phase of the action potential is phase 3, or what we call repolarization phase. So here you can see we have all of the numbers at this point starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, and then finally to that resting membrane potential of phase 4. And as you can see, looking back at the pacemaker action potential, phase 4, phase 0, and phase 3 are essentially the same parts. Similar things are happening in those cells, uh, the biggest difference really being phase 4. But there is no phase 1 or 2 like we see specifically in those myocyte action potentials. Again, that defining characteristic that we see within these cardiac muscle cells. So on, at this point, once again, we have various ion pumps, again, returning that normal ion concentration gradient within the cell. But there is one last thing specifically to these cells and with this action potential that's really important is something that we call either the effective refractory period or the absolute refractory period. And that's something that really begins from once that action potential starts and goes until we're well within our resting membrane potential of phase four. And what's really important to know about this period of time is that even if another signal comes to the cell, a new action potential cannot be propagated. So during this refractory period, the cell is going to be going through this action potential or recovering from it for a little bit at the end in which even if another signal comes along, it's not going to trigger that cell to have another action potential. Now another little interesting tidbit is even these non-pacemaker cells can actually spontaneously depolarize, uh, especially in situations like hypoxia, and this can trigger an action potential that can lead to ectopic beats and various different arrhythmias. Now I think going into why and how this happens is beyond the scope of this lesson, uh, but it is important to know that this is something that can happen, and this can often be the cause of different arrhythmias or those different ectopic beats that you see in your patient. Okay, so that covers the two different action potentials that 
play a vital role in ultimately leading to contraction of our cardiac muscle cells, how they work, how they're important, and as you'll see here in the future lesson, how different drugs have an impact on these action potentials and ultimately can improve our patient's arrhythmias. And so to wrap up this lesson, the last thing that I want to cover is the different classes of medications that we are going to find within this antiarrhythmic category. Now, this particular category is very diverse, and it's actually something that we further divide down into essentially five classes. And they each have their own specific mechanism of action, as well as their own specific monitoring parameters. And so in the next lesson, we are going to go in depth into each one of these. But I do want to give you a quick overview of these different classes now. So the way the naming convention works is it's pretty much just numbered. And like we said, there's five different classes. The first one is what we call class one. And interestingly enough, and unique specifically to this class, is this is actually further divided up into three subclasses, which we call 1A, 1B, and 1C. So there are some unique differences between these medications that do fall within a similar structure, having them all within one class. But again, we'll talk about this more in the next lesson. Then from there, we have our class two medications, our class three medications, never guess this one, class four medications. And then for the fifth and final class, you'll either see it referred to as class five, or sometimes you'll just hear it referred to as other antiarrhythmic agents. So these are the five classes, the three subclasses of our class one medications. Like I said, in the next lesson, we're going to do a deep dive into each of these classes and cover some of the medications that you're going to commonly come across while working in the ICU. All right, and so with that said, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I really hope this lesson had some good information for you guys. Uh, like I said, it was a lot of theory, uh, a lot of foundational information, which while you don't need to memorize all these different things that we talked about, when we talk about in the next lesson how some of these medications are working, it's going to help to give you a better understanding of what's actually happening and why we see the positive benefit from these medications. So if you did find this lesson useful, if you liked it, please leave us a like down below, as well as leave us a comment and subscribe if you haven't already. Stay tuned for that next lesson in which we do the deep dive into the different classes of antiarrhythmic medications. Otherwise, in the meantime, head on over and check out the last series of lessons that we did in which we looked at the endocrine system. As always, thanks so much for watching. You guys have a wonderful day.